Today on Know the Truth, Philip DeCourse reminds us that in Christ, we are well provided for. Whatever our problem is, whatever our life context is, the Jesus that you love and who loves you more than you love him, he's there for you. Make no mistake about it. In the darkness, you need to believe. In the difficulty, you need to believe. In the deficiency, you need to believe. Lord, help me to understand your sufficiency. Your grace, it is sufficient. Today on Know the Truth, Philip invites us to look over the disciples' shoulders as they follow Jesus' instructions to feed the thousands of people scattered across the countryside listening to him preach. The feeding of the 5,000 demonstrates the difference God can make in our lives right now, today. We're turning to the Gospel of Mark to learn what Jesus can do with our limited resources because his resources are limitless. Philip's concluding a message called Well Provided For, and stick around after the message to hear about some exciting new resources available at ktt.org. The feeding of the 5,000, the Christ who provides well for his people. And I'm struck by the sympathetic Christ, and I'm struck by the fact that before Jesus fills their stomachs with bread in Mark 6, which he will do, he fills their hearts with truth. He begins with teaching them about the fact that there is bread that they need for their souls as well as bread that they need for their stomachs. He is moved and he deals with the crowd with great tenderness. We see not only the sympathetic Christ, we see secondly what I'm calling the sovereign Christ. Jesus not only identifies with human needs, he controls the circumstances. We see him identifying with human needs here. He had compassion for them. He began to teach them many things. And now he unfolds this scenario. We're late in the day. They're hungry. Jesus says, you feed them. They go, Lord, what are you talking about? Us feed them? Do you know how much money it would take to feed this crowd of 5,000 men and more? Then Jesus says, well, what have we got available? You want to know what we've got available? We've got five loaves and two fish. And I want you to understand what Jesus says in verse 39. Then he commanded them. As this challenging situation unfolds, Jesus takes charge because he not only identifies with human need, he can control human circumstances. I want you to see secondly what I'm calling the stimulation because I think Jesus wants these men to, and he stimulates them and he encourages them to show greater faith. You see, the bigger he is, the better we do. And so this is a test. Look at verse 37. And Jesus answered his disciples and said, you give them something to eat. You're the answer. Or you could become the answer. And so I think not only do you have this situation that's big and hairy, you have this stimulation, this challenge to grow in their faith concerning the greatness of Christ. But the challenge is still here. When you and I are facing the impossible and the implausible, how big is Jesus? Now, let's be careful. He hasn't promised us those kind of miracles. But he has promised us sufficient grace. He has promised us his presence. We need to be persuaded of the fact that nothing will separate us from his love. All of that we must believe in the face of the impossible and the implausible. But are we going to trust God? Or are we going to do what the disciples did here? They're going to lean on their own understanding once again. And they're going to go, hey, can't be done. Better send them away. If you go to John's gospel, you have Philip out with his calculator. We don't have enough. But remember, he's being tested. And he's not using the strength that's available to him in Jesus Christ. So you've got the situation. You've got the stimulation, which brings us to the solution. Jesus takes charge of the situation. Remember what we said. He knew what he was going to do. And I have not sadly exposed their lack of faith. They failed once again. Mark tells us they didn't learn the lesson of the loaves. 
Jesus steps up to the plate. And he says, okay, guys, how many loaves do we have? Verse 38, go and see. And when they found out, they said five and two fish. Mark doesn't mention the boy. John will. John tells us it was a boy, a lad with his brown bag lunch. One commentator said that was another miracle in that he hadn't eaten it. (laughs) And he gives it over to Jesus and to his disciples, and the Lord takes it, and he commands his disciples, make them all sit down in groups on the green grass so that they sat in ranks. That's the Greek word for garden plot in an orderly fashion, hundreds and fifties. Then the Lord took that little brown bag lunch He broke the bread, broke the fish, prayed to God, blessed it, and it was given out, and a miracle took place. According to verse 42, they all ate and were filled. Now, the liberals tell us this was no miracle, by the way. You know what they tell us? You know how they were fed? Because when the little boy gave his lunch, everybody said, you know what, I've got a lunch and I'm not going to keep it anymore. And so everybody brought their lunches out and they all fed each other. Sometimes it takes more belief to believe their disbelief of the miracle than it does to believe the miracle itself. Because when Jesus is big, when he's God, then miracles aren't a problem. But Jesus meets the need, and we see a sovereign Christ. And you know what I love about this? And it's just a reminder. Because nobody can hope to be an effective disciple without a renewed awareness of the greatness of God. Just write down to yourself, as we see it, exemplified in this situation, which was a big and hairy problem. And we see it in the stimulation to show some faith in the greatness of Christ, but they failed. But we see here the solution, and we see Jesus take five loaves, two fish, from the pocket of a little boy and meets a need. Which would remind me, by the way, he's never out of answers. Just write down to yourself, He's never out of answers. He knew what he was going to do. I love that verse. I've gone to it many times when I'm scratching my own head about what's the next move or how to get past this problem or something in our family with the girls or June or ministry or whatever, and you'll be there and we'll all be there soon enough and we'll get out of there and then we'll be back there soon enough. But it's good to know, and I remind myself often, he knows what he's going to do. And I'm glad he knows what he's going to do because I haven't a clue what I'm going to do. It's great to know that because he's never out of answers. He finds a boy with a brown bag lunch, feeds an army of people, and he reminds us that he can take the unlikely and do the unthinkable. Since we're talking about feeding people, just as a backup to this, do be mindful of 1 Kings 17, verse 6. You know the story of Elijah. Go hide yourself, Elijah. I remember one of the first kind of picture Bible books I had as a boy I remember it just comes to mind, the picture of, you know, Elijah kind of holding out his hand in between the cleft of a rock. This picture had this black raven coming down with a piece of meat in his mouth for Elijah to take, like taking apples off a tree. What a beautiful picture. He takes a boy with five loaves and two fish and feeds 5,000 men, women beside. The boy's an unlikely source, and the miracle is unthinkable. Can I just remind you, those ravens were scavengers. How do you get scavengers to deliver meat without eating the meat? It's a miracle. God can take the unlikely, a small boy, ravens, and he can do the unthinkable. Why? Because he's never out of answers, and he always knows what he's going to do. He can do anything because he can use anything. He who created everything can do anything with anything. And since he created everything out of nothing, he can use anything or he can do everything without anything. Might take you all afternoon to unpack that, but I think there's a good thought there that he's never out of possibilities in the presence of impossibilities. I like the story of the pastor who had a plaque on his wall behind his desk and he counseled people there and he ministered to people in that office. And according to the story I read, the plaque said, Christ is the answer. 
And then beneath it, in smaller words, were these words, now what's your question? I like where he begins. He doesn't say, hey, what's your question? He says, Jesus is the answer. Now, what's your question? And when we understand what the question is, we'll see how Jesus answers it, because Jesus is the answer to everyone and anything. Let's get the last thought. The sympathetic Christ, the sovereign Christ, quickly, the sufficient Christ. We've kind of touched on this, so I just want to make it a point in and of itself and be encouraged. Jesus was faced with a need His disciples failed the test, but Jesus didn't fail. He knew what he was going to do, and he did it. And I want you to notice that he did it in a way that surpassed the need. I mean, that's what comes out of this story, isn't it? Scroll down to verse 42. So they all ate and were filled, and his disciples, that's they, his disciples took up 12 baskets full of fragments and of the fish. Now, you could allegorize that. I don't think we have any justification for doing it. Some commentators have tried it. Hey, there were 12 disciples who failed the test, and maybe they all had a basket each of leftovers just as a reminder of the fact that they failed to trust in the sufficient, sovereign, sympathetic Christ. He's not just enough. He's more than enough. I think that's a stretch. The simple point is the simple point, and it's not to be missed. There were 12 baskets of leftovers. Staggering. Jesus had taken care of his disciples and the crowd in an abundant, generous fashion. In fact, John 6, 11 says they ate as much as they wanted. They ate till they were filled, according to Mark. What happened to the 12 baskets? Again, the Bible's silent, And we should leave it that way. Were they given to the poor? Possibly. We don't need to know those facts because the point of the text is, as those disciples gathered those baskets, they came face to face with each basket collected that Jesus was sufficient. Now, I think they grasped that momentarily. Mark will tell us later, but they didn't learn it in a way that stuck. They didn't learn the loaves and the lesson of the loaves. And I think as they grabbed those baskets, their faces grew redder. But I think for a moment, their faith grew a little larger. And that's the takeaway, the sufficient Christ. I don't want to read into the text, and I've said that twice, but I think this may be justified. When you take the metaphor, this is a beautiful thought. When you take the metaphor of the shepherd, right, which has been introduced here by Mark, when he gets out of the boat, sees the crowd, sees them as sheep without a shepherd. He has compassion on them. Why? Because according to John 10, he's the good shepherd. Hebrews 13, he's the great shepherd. 1 Peter 5, he's the chief shepherd. That's what Jesus is. He's a shepherd. And here he feeds the sheep. What do we read? Verse 39, he commanded them to make them all sit down in groups on the green grass. I couldn't help but go to Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures, green grass. And he leads me beside the still waters and he walks with me through the valley of the shadow of death and he prepares a table for me in the presence of my enemies. What a beautiful verse. In fact, I texted that verse to one of the men in our church yesterday. He needed it. He was at the game between Ohio State and Michigan. (laughs) And he was a Buckeye, he's a friend of mine. He was up in Ann Arbor, and before the game started, I said, may the Lord prepare a table for you in the presence of your enemies. It's a great verse. And look where it goes, verse five. My cup runs over. Abundance. The good shepherd, get them all to sit down. Give me the five loaves and the two fish. Takes it, breaks it, blesses it, hands it out, and they are filled and there's 12 baskets left over. You getting the idea of the sufficiency of Christ? Because the bigger he is, the better we do. 
That's the lesson coming out of this story. We're well provided for. That's why Colossians and Hebrews makes that argument. Do you understand who he is? He's greater than Moses. He's bigger than the angels. He's the fulfillment of the Old Testament. After he offered himself as the one sacrifice for sin forever, he sat down. He is better than any Levitical priest. He's after the eternal priesthood of Melchizedek. His offering was once and for all. It's not the blood of goats and bulls that are offered again and again. No one ever sat down in the temple. No, this is the Jesus that you have come to believe in. Why would you go back to Judaism? Why would you go back? Because the bigger he is, the better you'll do. You won't sell out for something less. He's great. He's sufficient. So press on. Run the race with endurance. Go on to perfection. See him in Colossians. There's some form of early Gnosticism. No, Jesus isn't the Son of God, uncreated, the creator of all living things, the head of the church. No. And worshiped by angels? No. He's a kind of angel. He's a spiritual entity. He's a creation of God. He's way down the spiritual totem pole. He was created. He didn't create all things. He's not the head of the church. He's just one among a plethora of spiritual entities. And Paul says, absolutely not. In all things, he must have the preeminence. He's the creator of all living things. All things were created by him and for him, and all things consist because of him. He's the head of the church. And when you people understand that, and you go to Colossians 2, verses 6 through 10, he'll say, so walk in him as you've received him. The bigger he is, the better you'll do, because in him dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and we are complete in him. He's justification, sanctification, forgiveness, wisdom. He's everything you'll ever need for life and godliness. Don't be selling out. He's sufficient. And that's where we're wrapping up. He is sufficient. And you and I need to leave today with that idea that whatever our problem is, Whatever our big, hairy problem is, whatever our life context is, the Jesus that you love and who loves you more than you love him is sympathetic. He looks upon you with great tenderness. He wants the best for you, and he's there for you. Make no mistake about it. There are still reserves of his grace for you, and he's sovereign in the darkness you need to believe, in the difficulty you need to believe, in the deficiency you need to believe, he knows what he's going to do. Lord, help me not to fail the test. Help me to have a greater belief in your greatness. And Lord, help me to understand your sufficiency. Because the bigger you are, the better I do, regardless of what I'm facing. You have offered me, not just life, but according to John 10, 10, you've come that I might have life and that more abundantly. And I thank you, you've offered a peace and a tranquility, but it's not just any peace. It's a peace that passes all understanding. You're a sufficient Christ. And what you've offered me is abundant. I'm nowhere near the bottom of the barrel because there is no bottom to this barrel. Your love, Paul says, it surpasses all knowledge. Ephesians 3, verse 16, and your grace, well, Paul tells us from his own experience, it is sufficient. Warren Wearsby tells of a lady who lived in the projects her whole life. She went from paycheck to paycheck. She had never much more than a few pennies to rub together, as we say. One day she was taken outside the city to the coast for a little bit of a holiday. And it is said that she comes to the coastline and she looks over the vast blue ocean, something she had never seen before. She had just danced among the puddles of the city as a little girl. But now she sees this vast ocean and it is said that she cried. And she was heard to say this, it is so good to see something that there's plenty of. Her whole life was lived in deficiency. Paycheck to paycheck, penny rubbed against another penny. And she comes to this vast, deep, blue, inviting ocean, and she weeps at the thought, there are things in this world there's plenty of. Folks, John 1, verse 16 says, of his fullness have we received grace 
for grace. You've heard me deal with this text again and again. Grace after grace, or grace in the place of grace. It's the image of the waves of an ocean. Grace followed by grace. Go down to Newport Beach, wave after wave. You can sit there for an hour, 10 hours, 100 hours. Those waves never stop crashing in. Wave upon wave, you can ride them, you can run into them, you can swim in them. There's plenty of them, just like there's plenty of God's grace. Amen? More than you'll ever need. Don't fail the test. Enjoy that second blessing, that third blessing, that fourth blessing, that fifth blessing. The second blessing is learning you got it all in the first blessing. And the third blessing is realizing that that first blessing is so massive, it's gonna take you a long time to grasp how great it is. There's plenty of mercy, there's plenty of grace, there's plenty of patience, there's plenty of love. We're well provided for because he is utterly up to the task of taking us through life and then helping us conquer death and ushering us in victoriously into God's presence. Aren't you glad you've heard this message? With life, with all its demands, and sometimes you kind of can't feel the ocean ground beneath your feet. But let the waves of God's grace lift you up and keep you afloat. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the joy of knowing what the disciples came to know about you, that they are well provided for, that you are sympathetic and sovereign and sufficient. And Lord, we pray that the songs we have sung, the message we have heard and the song we're about to sing as a benediction will help us to get a bigger vision of who you are because the bigger you are, the better we do in life, ministry. Lord, thank you for reminding us that you can meet our need exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think. Help us not to feel the test. Thank you that you know what you're doing in our lives. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. That's Philip DeCourcy here on Know the Truth, a message called Well Provided For. Remember, you can revisit any message from the series, Essential Jesus, There Is No Stopping It, by going to our website at ktt.org. There you can also find additional resources, such as Philip's weekly Truth Matters email devotional. And if you're looking to access sermons on the go, you can download the KTT app for easy listening and sharing with others. Just visit the app store in your mobile device and search for Know the Truth with Philip DeCourcy. Today's message reminds us that God is full of love and compassion for His children. It's central to who He is and who we are to be as His born-again children. It's a central theme of an encouraging book Philip wants to get into your hands. It's called Gospel People, and in it, author Michael Reeves helps readers discover the biblical roots of the word evangelical, while encouraging them to reclaim its true meaning by standing with integrity as people of the gospel. A copy of Gospel People is yours when you give to know the truth. Just call 888-644-8811 or give online at ktt.org. You can also mail your donation to Know the Truth, Post Office Box 30250, Anaheim Hills, California, 92809. Now, if you're a new listener, we have a special welcome gift for you. It's a free booklet from Pastor Philip titled, Resting in God's Daily Sufficiency. And we're sure it'll bless your devotion times. Read it and then share it with a friend. Learn more at ktt.org. And while you're on our website, you'll find links to our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter pages so you can stay up to date on all things Know the Truth and share it with others. We're so glad you joined us today for Know the Truth. I'm Wayne Shepherd, inviting you to come back tomorrow for the final message in the series, Essential Jesus, There Is No Stopping It. That's Friday on Know the Truth with Philip DeCourcy. Today's program was produced and sponsored by Know the Truth Incorporated. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free.